Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have this opportunity to be in your house. We thank you that we have this opportunity to worship you and to magnify your name, this, this freedom that we have here to gather here, uh, to glorify your name. And uh, I pray, Lord God, that as these next few moments, as we gather around your word, as we read your word together, as we share your word together, that you will speak to us, Lord God, that we will hear your voice and we will respond to your word. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will uh, break down those walls and barriers that we have in our lives towards you, those preconceived ideas that we have about you. And we pray, Lord God, that we will hear your voice and respond to you. We pray for our family and friends who are away from us today. Lord God, wherever they are, whatever they're doing, we pray that you'll be with them and that you will give them more of your grace and mercy and peace. We ask in your precious name, Lord God. Amen. Um, So we kind of start back with our series that we've been journeying through together for Songs um, for the Road. Uh, And we will drop in it this week and then we'll we'll miss it again for the next few weeks as we go to uh, looking at Resurrection Sunday. And then we're going to be looking at our DNA series uh, once more. And then following that, we'll come back in uh, to this Songs for the Road and finish it probably at the end of May time. Um, And so that would be really good. Um, So these Songs for the Road, as we've uh, kind of put them out there for you to listen to, We'd ask you to remind yourselves of what we've been talking about and sharing uh, because this series is about about discipleship, what it means to be a disciple and a follower of Jesus Christ. And so as we've been journeying together and singing these songs for the road and identifying these songs, these bring highlights to our lives about songs perhaps we didn't know or songs that we were aware of, but actually we'd forgotten the meaning of. And so these songs are songs that we have read together and shared together and that we learn together. And so we continue, and we will sing, and we will read. I was going to say we're going to sing. We'll read Psalm 126 together. Psalm 126. When the Lord brought back his exiles to Jerusalem, it was like a dream. We were filled with laughter, and we sang for joy. And the other nations said, what amazing things the Lord has done for them. Yes, the Lord has done amazing things for us. What joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, as streams renew the desert. Those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go to plant their seed, but they sing as they return with the harvest. I was delighted this morning that as, uh, as people took part this morning that uh, that Fabi prayed, and the prayer that she prayed this morning was significant prayer, because the prayer that she prayed this morning was that in the presence of the Lord there is fullness of joy, joy. That's the theme of this chapter. That's the theme of this chapter with regards to our situations and circumstances. Whatever we may face, we actually in Christ can have joy. Yeah. Now, I know there's this very stereotypical image of what a Christian is supposed to look like. This stereotypical image that's perhaps been portrayed by the media over uh, many, many years. These, this stereotypical image of the, of the Christian, of the person who is, is just a busybody. He's just a person who is a, a do-gooder. And also, actually, is recognized as a killjoy. Yes? Uh, have you ever been called a killjoy, being a follower of Jesus Christ? Uh, I know I have. Uh, This idea that actually as a follower of Jesus Christ, you have to have a face down to the ground because the joy is so deep, so deep that you can't see it because you're so horrified about the things that go on in the world around you. And actually all you do is you point out to other people all their faults, all their things that they've done wrong. So actually what you are described as, as is a killjoy. A Christian who never cracks a smile, who never shares a joke, who never loosens up. But despite the media portrayal of what perhaps a Christian is supposed to look like or sound like, I'm not too, I'm not too sure about you, but I've met very few. I've met very few people like that. I'm sure we could point out one or two people who come to our mind that we think about those things, because after all, that's where a stereotype comes from, because it comes from examples like that. But I hope you'll agree with me that actually that That image of a follower of Jesus Christ is few and far between, isn't it? 
I've got to be honest with you, I have most of my fun with other people who are followers of Jesus Christ. I'll have a lot of fun with people who know and follow Jesus Christ. Lots of laughter and lots of jokes and lots of just good times together. Because actually one of the delightful discoveries along the way of being a Christian disciple is actually how much enjoyment there should be. You wouldn't know it this morning, would you, after you lost an hour? But how much enjoyment there should be as a follower of Jesus Christ. How much laughter you should hear as a follower of Jesus Christ. How much sheer joy you can find as a follower of Jesus Christ. And this psalm opens up with verse 2. We were filled with laughter and we sang for joy. We were filled with laughter and we sang for joy. I wonder why they were filled with laughter and sang for joy. I wonder why. Well, if you read why, you you discover why and we're going to journey why. Because actually when we discover things like this, why they were filled with laughter and they were filled with and they sang for joy, we should be doing the same. I laugh at the fact that God chose me. (laughs) How about you? I laugh at the fact that God chooses someone like me. I have no idea why, but God does, and he forgives me and washes my sins clean, and he calls me a son of his. That brings a smile to my face. How about you? It brings joy to my heart. How about you? In actual fact, I laugh about it at times. Joy, it's the tune of the follower of Jesus Christ. Joy is the song which we should sing. Joy is the second in Paul's list of fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. And actually, it's the first sign in the Gospel of John of joy. Jesus turns water into wine. There's some joy and celebration about that, trust me. And and often as we read Scripture together and we journey through Scripture together, actually, it's the smiles that we see throughout the Scripture that actually often carry more meaning than the sermons themselves. Think about it. The feeding of the 5,000. Where did this come from? Who provided all this? Oh my goodness. The smiles, the satisfaction, the joy. What about the raising the dead? You're not telling me there's not joy there? (laughs) And delight? What What about healing the sick? What about Jesus making his disciples breakfast on the beach following his resurrection? (sighs) What joy, what delight. It should bring smiles to our faces. And Jesus often brought smiles to people's faces and he brought joy to many. But does all of this mean that joy is a requirement for Christian living? No. No that we kind of paint on some happy clown face to hide the sadness and the hurt and the pain that lies beneath. No. Many of us experience events that are full of sadness and full of pain. Many of us descend to such low points in our lives that often we can feel like joy has permanently left us. And at those times, don't don't you dare begin to say, "Well, well, that's proof that I'm not a good Christian. Or don't you dare begin to say, well, if we're supposed to have our mouths filled with laughter and our tongues filled with shouts of joy, and I don't, and I can't, I'm not a very good Christian. It's got nothing to do with it. Joy is not a requirement of Christian discipleship. It's a consequence of Christian discipleship. It's not what we have to get in order to experience life in Christ. It comes when we are walking in the way of faith and obedience when we're walking this road with him and we're walking this road together. That's where joy comes. But we often try and get joy from elsewhere. We often seek for joy in other situations and other circumstances. Many of us seek joy from entertainment. Don't we? Many of us seek joy from entertainment. We, we pay someone to make jokes. We we pay someone to tell stories. We we pay someone to perform dramatic actions. We we pay someone to sing songs. 
or as the author of the message puts it, Eugene Peterson, he puts it, we buy the vitality of another's imagination to divert and enliven our own poor lives. We buy the vitality of another's imagination to divert and enliven our own poor lives. But that kind of joy, it never penetrates our lives. It never impacts our lives. The effects are only temporary. Isn't it? So I like, I like watching the X Factor. I know, don't judge me. I like the X Factor. But it doesn't change my life. There's, a per, there's, a, there's an element of joy while I'm watching it. There's an element of joy when I hear them sing and I, and I appreciate the gift that they've got. But it doesn't change my life. It doesn't impact me in such a way that I carry that joy of the X Factor around with me for the rest of my life. The things of this world are just temporary. The joy that we try and seek in the entertainment of this world, it's just temporary. It doesn't impact us. It doesn't change us. It changes us just for a few moments, for a few minutes, a few days at most. And actually, when we run out of money, the joy trickles away. Because we can't buy joy anymore. Do you know what? We can't make ourselves joyful. (laughs) Think about it. We can't make ourselves joyful. Joy can't be real joy, can't be commanded or purchased or arranged. I can't tell you to be joyful and then for you to go, oh, I am. It's not something you buy. It's not something you prearrange. It's not something you can be commanded to do. But from this psalm, there is something we can do. Because what we can decide to do is to live in response to the abundance of God and not under the dictatorship of our own poor needs. We can decide to live in the environment of a living God and not our own dying selves. We can decide to center ourselves in the God who generously gives and not in our own egos which greedily grabs. And one of the certain consequences of such a life is joy. The kind of joy that's expressed in this psalm. The center of this psalm in verse 3. The center of this psalm declares this. Yes, the Lord has done amazing things for us. What joy. The Lord has done amazing things for us. What joy. And if you look at this chapter, it's surrounded by other verses. The the first two verses, well, actually, they're centered on the past. The the verses after that are actually highlighting the future. Your present joy, it has a past, and it has a certain future. That's where your joy comes from. It has a past of what God has done, and it has a future of what God is going to do. Present joy and gladness has a past and future. It is not a temporary emotion. It is not based on your feelings. And the background of joy is only hinted at here, but the words trigger memories. Verse 1, when the Lord brought back his exiles to Jerusalem. It was like a dream. It was like a dream. We, we were filled with laughter, and we sang for joy. And the other nations said, what amazing things the Lord has done for them. What amazing things. What amazing things is the psalmist talking about? Well, we know the story, don't we? We know the story of God's people in a long, apparently inescapable bondage of slavery. Under the shadow of the Egyptian rulers, they live a harsh life a life full of slavery, and then suddenly, without warning, it's over. It's finished. And one day they're making bricks without straw, and the next they're on the, red, the other side of the Red Sea, and they're singing songs like this in Exodus chapter 15. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me 
the victory. This is my God, and I'll praise him. That's what they're thinking about. And then we turn over a few pages, and then there's the story of David. There's years of wilderness with David. There's guerrilla warfare with David. There's an existence that's perilous with David as he tries to serve a moody, manic king. And then there's all that groping around and praying through the guilt of the murder and the adultery that he's committed. And then if you journey with us on a Sunday night and you're going through the Bible stories, you'll see that in his old age, he's chased from his throne by his own son and he's forced to set up his own government in exile. Yet at the end of David's life, his song is this in 2 Samuel 22. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my savior. You turn a few more pages in the history of Israel, and you come across the terrible Babylonian captivity. And Israel experiences some of the worst things we could ever experience in our lives. Murder, rape, cannibalism, torture, and then strangely, bizarrely, incredible joy. And it starts with comfort. Comfort, my people, says God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her sad days are gone and that her sins are pardoned. Isaiah chapter 40, he goes on to say in Isaiah 43, and there's reassurances of help. When you go through deep waters, I'll be with you. Don't be afraid because I'm with you. And the gratitude and the gladness begins to build. And as it begins to build, it moves into joy. And you read about it in Isaiah 52. The watchmen shout and sing with joy. For before their very eyes, they see the Lord returning to Jerusalem. Let the ruins of Jerusalem break into joyful song. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. No wonder the psalmist says, it's like a dream. It's like a dream. Because every act of God was something that was impossible, but has been made possible. Every act of God was a miracle. There was no way this could have happened, and yet it did. It seemed like a dream. And when God breaks in, They can't help be filled with joy, and they can't help be filled with laughter. Recall those memories for yourself of when God has done something for you, when God has impacted your life, and you thought everything was done, and everything was over, and everything was finished with, and then suddenly God breaks in and changes everything, and he turns your sadness and your mourning into joy. And so it should fill our lives with joy. And actually, it should fill our lives with laughter. And we hold on to these memories. We hold on to these memories of laughter. And we hold on to these shouts of joy. And we fill our minds with the stories of God's acts. That's why it's important to read these. And that's why it's important to tell our stories. It reminds ourselves of what God has done. Joy has a history. It's as, as real as a date in history, and it's as solid as a rock, because no one can take that away. And joy is nurtured by living in such a history and building on those foundations. But joy just doesn't have a history. Joy has a future. If the joy-producing acts of God are characteristics of our past as God's people, they'll also be characteristic of our future as well. Do you get that? If God has acted in the past, because that's in his character and nature, he's going to act again in the future, because that's who he is. There's no reason for us to suppose that God will suddenly change the way that he's worked with us. What he's done in the past, he's going to do again and again and again. What we have known of him, we know of him. And just as joy builds on the past, it borrows from the future and it expects certain things to happen. The first is this, in verse 4. Restore our fortunes, Lord, 
as streams renew the desert. The Negev, the south of Israel, it's a vast desert. The watercourses of the Negev are a network of ditches cut into the soil by wind and rain erosion. And for many of the years, they are baked dry under the sun, but suddenly rain comes and it makes the desert ablaze with blossom. How our lives can be like that. Yes? That we can be drought stricken, that we can feel that we are barren, we feel that the sun bakes down on us and it is relentless and what we cry for is rain. And then suddenly, after long years of barren waiting, we are interrupted by God's invasion of grace and it changes everything. The second image is this. Those who plant in tears, (laughs) they will harvest with shouts of joy. Those that plant with tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go and plant their seed but they will return singing. (laughs) It's clear in Psalm 126 that the one who wrote it and those who sang it, there were no strangers to dark stuff happening in their lives. There were no strangers to it. They carried the painful memory of exile. They carried the scars of oppression on their backs. They knew the barrenness of their hearts. And they endured night after night of weeping. They knew what it meant to sow in tears. You see, Christian joy is not to escape from sorrow. Pain and hardship still come. But it is unable to drive out the joy of our salvation. Do we get it? Whatever pain, whatever situation, whatever circumstance... It is is unable to drive out the joy of our salvation. Our strategy is this. Avoid the things that cause us hurt and pain in order that we can achieve joy. That's what we try and do. We, We get rid of the pain by numbing the nerve ends. We get rid of insecurity by eliminating risks. We get rid of disappointments by depersonalizing our relationships. And then we try to lighten the boredom of such a life by buying joy in the form of holidays or entertainment. But there's not a hint of this in Psalm 126. There's plenty of suffering on both sides. The past and the future. But joy comes because God knows how to wipe away our tears. And in his resurrection, he creates the smile of new life In us, joy is what God gives, not what we need to work up. (laughs) Laughter is the delight, (laughs) is the delight that things are working together for good for those who love God. (laughs) When everything else around you is falling around, we can afford to laugh (laughs) because we know our God is for us. So who can be against us? Our situations and circumstances around us may seem desperate. Do you know what? We can still laugh because God holds us in the palm of his hand and he's never going to let us go. Our situations and circumstances can do all sorts of things, but it can never rob the joy that God has placed within our hearts. The joy that develops on the road is not about how good you feel. It's about how good God is. Because we find that his ways are dependable. And his promises are sure. This joy is not dependent on our luck. It's not dependent on our health. It's not dependent on avoidance of pain. Our joy is actually in the midst of pain and suffering and loneliness and misfortune. Paul is a wonderful example of this. In one way or another, as he goes through the difficult stuff, all you can actually hear from him is shouts of joy in the midst of his pain. Shouts of joy in the midst of his suffering and loneliness and misfortune. Romans 5 verse 3, Paul writes this, We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. (laughs) 
You've got every right to laugh at that. It's great, isn't it? Paul writes this in Romans 5.11. We can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends with God. <laughs> Philippians 4, verse 4, out of his prison cell, Paul writes this, always be, fu be full of joy in the Lord. I say it to you again, rejoice. That's what Paul writes in prison. Always be full of the joy of the Lord. I say it to you again, rejoice. You see, this psalm doesn't give us a formula for joy, but it shows us the emptiness of the world's joy and reaffirms the depth and reality of God's joy. He's been there for us in the past, and he's going to be there for us in the future, which means we can have joy right now in the midst of it all. This psalm announces that there is a people who gather to worship God, who go and live in a world to bring honor and glory to God in everything that they say and do, whose lives are bordered on one side by a memory of what God has done and on the other side about what God is going to do and whatever else is happening in their lives right now, at the center of it all, we are a joyful people and we will forever sing this song. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, let our mouths be filled with laughter. <laughs> let our lips be filled with praise. Let us recognize once more what you have done for us, glorious Lord. What you have changed with us, wonderful Savior. What you have restored to us already, Lord God. We stand in awe of who you are. And we recognize what you have done for us, Lord God. And so we stand firm in the promises that you have given us. And may the joy overwhelm our lives. May it pour out of our lives. May we be filled with praise on our lips because of who you are and what you've done. As has already been prayed this morning, may we never say stop talking about you. May we never stop praising you. May we never stop laughing at the wonderful things that you have done for us. I'm reminded, Lord God, of Abraham's wife who was promised a child and her response was laughter <laughs> because actually God when you call us to do things and you promise things over our lives in the reality of it all we may laugh but actually the laughter is knowing that God you can do all things and so we rest in you and we take joy and delight in you and Lord God as a follower of yours may we never forget this song for the road because whatever is of the past and whatever lies before us, our joy is in you, Lord God.